How has the country moved so far from the intentions of its founding fathers? How has the American dream become so distorted? Over the last 30 or 40 years, capitalism has taken this extreme form. And a lot of it goes back to the economist Milton Friedman from the Chicago School and Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher and, and others buying into these policies that really encourage people to take on huge amounts of debt, encourage privatization, uh, smaller government supposedly, although bigger military, so, so actually the government spending goes up. Deregulation, getting rid of rules that govern the people who run our institutions, especially our corporations. It's as though we suddenly are supposed to believe that the human beings who sit at the top of corporations uh, don't need to be regulated. They're some sort of gods. Milton Friedman, his protégés the Chicago Boys, and the neoclassical ideology beat the classical approach to economics and became the framework for what we today call capitalism. There are two main competing economic approaches which determine how we humans manage the world and distribute wealth. These are the classical and neoclassical schools. The classical school favors less government interference, more personal autonomy, and recognizes that humans cannot function without natural resources. The neoclassical school, which has a more dismissive view of natural resources, thinks government should rule the economy, solve social problems, and leave the free market to look after the distribution of wealth. The neoclassical school emerged around 100 years ago due to vested interests' desire to protect their assets. This meant that neoclassical mathematical models and assumptions were divorced from reality. They're based on what ought to be, instead of the classical models which are based on what actually is. It's these neoclassical models which favor large corporations that have been used to legitimize the financialization of the global economy. Championed by Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher, neoclassical economics still dominates policy making today. The uh, Reagan revolution, as we call it in the United States, obviously the Reagan-Thatcher revolution, if you think about it more globally, was a big change in power structure and a big transfer of opportunity and wealth uh, now, it wasn't, it's, not, it's not that the poor gave it to the rich. It was a transfer within the well-to-do, so that the financial sector in particular, in the United States, for example, but also in the UK and some other places, became vastly more profitable. And wages in, in that sector went up a lot. I mean, we focus on bonuses, but it's also base salaries went up, a lot, overall compensation. So there's a transfer from the non-financial part of the economy to the financial part of the economy that actually is unprecedented as far as we can see in, in any of the available data to us, and I'm talking about all of recorded human history. In 1932, in the aftermath of America's great stock market crash, a piece of legislation was passed to protect society. The Glass-Steagall Act was introduced to separate ordinary high street banking from investment banking. 67 years later, in 1999, under the influence of Treasury Secretary Larry Summers and his predecessor Robert Rubin, President Bill Clinton repealed the Glass-Steagall Act. Once again, banks could take ordinary depositors' money and speculate with it on virtually anything they liked. Wall Street is, has become a very particular uh, type of casino. Uh, and it's unfortunately not the kind of casino uh, they have in Las Vegas, which is you know, a perfectly legitimate form of entertainment. Uh, it, it is a casino that has massive negative repercussions on the rest of society. So it's not just losing your money on a few wild nights, it's about the way in which those organizations lose their money, impacting the whole of society, uh, leading to a massive loss of jobs. This unfettered gambling pushed the entire global financial system to near collapse, with balances and debt obligations larger than the GDP of entire countries, the banks had become too big to fail. The West was unprepared, and bankers met their reeling and disorientated governments. You have to bail us out. We need money. If you don't give us the money, the whole thing goes down. And what are you going to do with millions and tens of millions of people who have lost everything in their bank account? You, you will have a revolution on your head. So fork over the money. 
borrow, borrow the money, create it out of nothing, and give it back to and give it to us, and 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 so that we can face our our problems and uh, not go under, and or otherwise. And this is what uh, Mr. Hank Paulson did in the U.S. Congress. He went there one day and he told them, "Well, look, we need 700 billion, and we need it now." Or else. Is this system we call capitalism really capitalism? In a capitalist system, government is supposed to be small, but today the state is more bloated and invasive than it's ever been. Individuals and companies are supposed to operate in a free market. Good enterprise is rewarded with profit and flawed enterprise with failure. But during the 2008 banking crisis, the people saw the Western economic system divided in a way they were told could never happen. Socialism for the rich, capitalism for the poor. And in America, for example, the banks that got in trouble got bailed out by the government. That's socialism. And they, people are arguing against socialism in America, and yet it's probably the most socialist country in the world right now. Uh, we have a system which isn't even a proper capitalist system. Uh, rich people make mistakes that they don't get punished. Uh, poor people make mistakes that they get punished. Yeah? Or even worse, that they don't make any mistake and they are forced to yeah, that, uh, pay for the mistakes of the rich. When the taxpayer is footing the bill for the misplaced speculation of bankers, then suddenly, instead of the economy serving the human being, the human being is now in perpetual service to amoral financial organizations. It was the head of the Federal Reserve Bank, Alan Greenspan, who after 9-11 slashed interest rates to encourage lending. Bankers needed new participants to keep cash flowing into a system that had become a global pyramid scheme. All this newly created money entered the housing market and created unprecedented inflation. House prices rose and rose. New mothers were forced back into the workplace to service huge home loans, and the Anglo-American dream became all about land speculation. The housing market in the West isn't about ownership. The housing market in the West, because it's the only way ordinary people can get ahead, and ordinary people can't get ahead but by wages, what we've created is a mass bubble economics around housing. So that sucks in a huge amount of capital, takes capital for genuine innovations in the economy, and puts it into a speculative use that has no genuine productive outcome. It's interesting if you talk to people in Germany, for example, they don't see a connection between owning a piece of property and, and being inclined to be, towards being democratic. There's lots of people who rent their housing there, and they're perfectly comfortable with that arrangement. But it is true that in somewhat different contexts, both Mr. Reagan and Mrs. Thatcher pushed for more people to own housing. And actually, this is part of the problem. Because if you push people to buy housing before they're ready, and if, so if, you, if you push very dubious loans on them, and they don't understand what they get themselves into, you can have huge adverse repercussions, exactly what led to, in part, the subprime housing crisis in the United States. Uh, that's not anything to do with democracy. That's just a bad economic idea. The breakthrough that occurred around the year uh, 2000 in the United States was when bankers found out that the poor are honest. And uh, they realized that if you're poor, if you're not rich, uh, you have a different set of values. And you think that a debt is a debt, and it's something that has to be paid. And the people will try to pay the debts that they're stuck with, even if the debts are not valid even if the debts uh, are much more than they expected, even if they really can't pay the debts. The lending and banking institutions, uh, when they drew up contracts with interest rates, with flexible interest rates, I think they knew in the beginning that these problems were going to come back later on where folks weren't going to be able to afford the mortgages as the interest rates increased. It put a lot of people in situations where they were taking food out of refrigerators, taking kids out of higher education, they're not able to afford college anymore. And it is making a really, really bad situation worse. The banks engaged in what was a criminal conspiracy to charge more to the blacks and Hispanics. 
the banks got together, backed the Bush administration to block the state prosecutions of uh, racial lending in order to exploit and charge more to the minorities. These are loans which were made by one of the major lenders in the city and in this country, Wells Fargo, in which Wells Fargo targeted minority communities in the city, uh, put borrowers into loans that they could not afford, put borrowers into loans um, that, that were of the subprime variety, therefore more expensive and less advantageous to the borrowers. Hiding predatory lending practices in the small print of complex financial products was only ever going to enrich one set of interests. Many of the communities in which African Americans live in the city were establishing momentum. There was development activity that was occurring. We were seeing signs of vitality in many of these communities and the results of the Wells Fargo foreclosures and the subprime lending practices of that lender and others um, has significantly impaired that progress and, and brought it to a halt. They're not worrying about, they don't, they don't come in the heart of it. Like you in the heart of it, so you see, they don't really see the struggle if they don't come in the heart of it, they see the outside of it. That's like looking at the cover of a book and seeing the outside of, the, seeing the outside of a book, but if you don't go inside the book, then you'll never know what the book about. So they're not worrying about nobody else but themselves. And I think it's wrong because if they come in the heart of it and they see it, they'll be willing to help. What happened in Baltimore is just one example of what is happening all around the world. One way to frame this injustice is by branding it a race issue. But when we look really closely, we can see that there is something at play here that transcends race, profit. Not an accident, for instance, that we had the deregulation in our financial industry that was such a disaster. Uh, the lobbyists of the finance industry amount to five per congressperson. In other words, they pay, pay five people for every congressman to explain to them, persuade them, that they should pass legislation that is favorable to the financial industry. The poor people who are devastated don't have the money. They couldn't hire five per congressman. So the way our, our democracy works, it's an unlevel playing field. The financial sector has acquired enormous power, partly through political contributions, so buying favors, but mostly through ideological control, convincing people that finance is good, more finance is better, and unregulated finance without limit is best. And, and that is really the, the cornerstone of this, what we call in the United States, the Wall Street, Washington corridor. I mean, if people need any proof as to who's controlling Washington, when the bailout came after Lehman Brothers collapsed, 80% of the population was against the bailout. Notwithstanding that, the uh, Congress passed the bailout, just showing, in my view anyway, that it's really under the control of banking interests. It's not a reflection of good democracy when a company, a group of companies, an industry, says uh, our interests are more important than the national interest. How can that happen? Very easy. That's the role of campaign contributions, lobbying, and America's political structure. Uh, we have a flawed democracy. This is an advanced oligarchy in the sense that uh, its main mechanism of control, if you like, is through convincing people that you really need, for example, the six biggest banks in the United States in their particular, in the particular form they exist today with the very light level of regulation. And if you don't have them, if you try to change that, all kinds of awful things will happen. And this is not really blackmail. I mean, it sounds like blackmail, but they convince you it's not blackmail, it's just that's the way the world is. There's nothing you can do about it. Oh my goodness, you just have to cooperate with them. It's very clever. The Fed is essentially the lobbyist for the commercial banking system. When you say you want to turn regulation over to the Fed, you're saying the financial sector and Wall Street should be self-regulated. And uh, the Wall Street has veto power over whoever is going to be the head of the Federal Reserve. As long as you give veto power over the regulators to Wall Street, as long as you pick the bank regulators from the banking industry itself, uh, you can forget any thought of uh, calling it regulation. It's deregulation, and to call it regulation instead of deregulation is using Orwellian doublethink. Democracy 
is government by the people. Plutocracy is government by the rich. In a typical plutocratic state, economic inequality is high, social mobility low, and because of continuous exploitation of the masses, workers find it nearly impossible to climb out of poverty. The equal voting rights movement in the early 20th century abolished a system where rich people had more votes than poor people. But today, lobbying has put pay to that and reduced the American political system to a mere clearinghouse for the concerns of the rich. The Goldman Sachs machine is one of using profits to buy influence in Washington to change laws to make it easier to make money on Wall Street to be used to buy influence in Washington. So it's a self-reinforcing malfeasance machine that uh, is continuing to grow as a parasite in the economy and continuing to kill the host. Famous for claiming it did God's work, Goldman Sachs is one of the most influential investment banks in the world. Its alumni often occupy positions of great influence in governments and central banks. In September 2008, barely a month before the stock market crash, Goldman, supposedly a pillar of the free market, changed its banking status from investment to commercial. This meant it was now eligible for state protection. Socialism for the rich, right there. Goldman Sachs are extremely efficient at what they do. Their task is to make money. Uh, they make bank robbers like Willie Sutton look like modest amateurs. Uh, they're huge bank robbers, but it's legal. The system is set up so that they can do it. In the recent years, they've been selling securities put together from mortgages that they knew were worthless. Uh, so they're selling these things to unwitting consumers, making a ton of money on it. Meanwhile, they're betting that they're going to fail because they know that it, what they're peddling is rotten. So they placed bets with the credit default swaps and other things with a huge insurance company, AIG, and that was insuring Goldman Sachs against the failure of the stuff they're peddling. During America's subprime collapse, Goldman traders Michael Swenson and Josh Birnbaum made a $4 billion profit by short-selling junk mortgages. Backed by Dan Sparks, internally Goldman Sachs called their position the big short and bet against their own clients. Senator Carl Levin called Goldman Sachs chief executive Lloyd Blankfein to a Senate subcommittee to testify under oath. Much has been said about the supposedly massive short Goldman Sachs had on the U.S. housing market. The fact is, we were not consistently or significantly net short the market in residential mortgage-related products in 2007 and 2008. We didn't have a massive short against the housing market, and we certainly did not bet against our clients. Riding the big short in 2007 made billions of dollars for Goldman. And so far, they've got away scot-free with this massive heist. So they're now back bigger than before, richer than before. Uh, biggest profits they've had in history, you know, huge bonuses. They're doing great. Uh, a, lot of what a lot of what they're doing has, in fact, probably uh, maybe all of it, has almost nothing to do with the benefit of the economy. Can there be any objection to genuinely talented people earning big money if they bring something new and tangible to the world? If they take great personal risks with their own money and actually bring greater prosperity for all? In a free market, if I have a brilliant idea that I can run an automobile on grass clippings, as an example, and I produce that car, my motivation might be to make money. But if the market says, my goodness, this is the greatest automobile ever invented by mankind, and I make a billion dollars, I've not only served myself, but I have served everyone else that needs transportation. And that is the brilliance of a free market, is that paradox that you can serve yourself and simultaneously serve others. And that's what it's all about. But how many of the general public have achieved greater prosperity through a banker's bonus? 
It was against the holy backdrop of St Paul's Cathedral in London that Goldman Sachs Vice Chairman and mouthpiece Lord Griffiths gave insight into how certain bankers really think. The devoted Christian defended extortionate bonuses. I'm not a person of despair, I'm a person of hope. And I think that we have to tolerate the inequality as a way to achieving greater prosperity and opportunity for all. The fundamental Christian view, and I would say of Islam as well, and certainly of Judaism, <clears throat> is that wealth is to be shared. Money has to be shared. You can't take it with you. And, and from that develops a whole lot of stuff about justice and the economy and so on. And we've lost that, and instead we've got people accumulating more and more. And I just think it's, I just think it's disgusting that people have lost their homes, they lost their jobs, they can't pay their mortgages from bankers who made a big mistake and then paid enormous bonuses. I'm sorry, that is simply wrong. And I can't understand why we are not more vociferous about that. Uh, when rich people tell you that they specifically have to be rich through these egregious rip-off mechanisms, uh, that's just self-serving propaganda and it should be disregarded. It is true that if you, when you organize human society, some people get ahead and some people struggle. That's a natural mechanism. Um, but saying, oh, we've got to have inequality, therefore Goldman Sachs must be organized along the following lines, that's a complete non sequitur. At what juncture, what point does morality enter into economic, uh, the economic calculus? In a way, uh, many people think that Adam Smith gave us a free pass, uh, uh, a way not to think about morality. Because what Adam Smith said was that individuals in the pursuit of their self-interest are led as if by an invisible hand to the general well-being of, of society. Now let me make it clear, Adam Smith didn't really say that. <laughs> that is to say, Adam Smith was very much aware that businesses, when they got together, conspired against the public interest, raised prices. He was aware of monopoly. He was aware of the importance of education that the private sector couldn't provide. So he himself was aware of all the limitations, but his latter-day descendants have forgotten all those caveats. Adam Smith was the godfather of classical economics, but since its publication, his work has been used as a political football financiers twisting his words to suit them. Lord Griffiths advocates ruthless individualism to push this idea that if bankers get rich, then we get rich too, through a process known as trickle-down economics, or horse and sparrow theory. If you feed the horse enough oats, some will pass through to the road for the sparrows. The idea is that extreme wealth concentrated on a small minority will eventually trickle down to everyone else. But it doesn't work. Because by the time the money reaches the people at the bottom of our money pyramid, it's lost its purchasing power. But the public are now confused as to why our political leaders have allowed this to happen and quite naturally now ask why. Because our political processes are badly flawed. They're badly flawed because of the dependence on lobbyists on campaign contributions. So that's why, you know, my view and a view I think of a, a lot of people is that we have to restructure our political processes to give more voice to the ordinary citizen and less voice to, to, the, to the interest group, to the moneyed groups, to, to those who, who, who have taken such a large role in, in shaping our tax code, our regulatory regulations, and so forth. I stood on the front step of Colin Powell's house, and I look at him and say, what, what, what next, boss? And he said, what do you mean? And I said, what next? Where are you going next? When I'm going to write my book. I said, no, I know, I know you're going to write your book, but you're not going to do that for the rest of your life. Where are you going next? He said, maybe a cabinet position, but first, 
but first, money. I said, money? He said, yeah, millions. That's the only way you can be a cabinet officer in the American government. Oh, wow. The Democrats and the Republicans are beholden to corporate interests, and until they become unbeholden to those corporate interests, we will never have a well-governed republic.